Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining me today. My name is Amanda Augustine and I'm the resident career expert for Top Resume, as well as its sister sites, Top Interview and Top CV. You can request a resume review at any time by visiting topresume.com. I'm so excited because if you've joined me in the past, I had been doing these weekly Q and A's and we took a little break and now I'm coming back and we're gonna start doing these on a monthly basis and see how they go. Uh, today's topic is 100% about resumes, but of course I will answer any and all job search questions to the best of my ability. And if it's something that I need to find more information on, I will happily do that as well. So today is all about getting your questions answered when it comes to finding a job in this incredibly challenging time, uh, writing a resume that's going to stand out and for all the right reasons. And so today, I mean, normally when I do one of these, I spend about half the time talking uh, and providing tips and the other half answering specific questions. Uh, I'd really like to try and dedicate a larger portion of today's discussion uh, to answering your questions, to make sure that we get all of them. Um, of course, if there aren't that many questions, I will happily delve into more resume tips. Um, if you've listened to me before, joined any of these events in the past, you know I am a very proud job search geek. And so I will happily talk about the job search and the resume uh, till the cows come home. However, I would like to make sure that I'm providing enough time to answer all of your questions because one of the more uh, recent events, I ran out of time. So let's see how many we can get through today. Uh, if you're just joining me, my name is Amanda Augustine. I'm the resident career expert for Top Resume, as well as our sister sites, Top Interview and Top CV. And today we're talking all about resumes uh, and I'm going to answer any and all questions you have about resume writing, the job search, whether you are just starting out and you recently graduated, congratulations by the way, or if you've been in the workforce for quite um, a longer period of time and you're looking for advice, I'm happy to provide that information. Uh, my goal is to provide a little information up front uh, to give you some framework on what makes a really solid resume, what are some of the things you should be thinking about um, as you're writing this, but then of course I'm gonna open it up to questions. So if you do have a question, please type it in the comment section below and I will scroll through. If you wanna say hi now and let me know what's going on in your world. Hey Gigi, nice to see you. Um, I am happy uh, to answer any of those questions as well. All right, so without further ado, I'm gonna just jump into some basic resume tips to help set you up for success during this current economic climate which I know is an incredibly, incredibly rough time to be looking for work. Uh, you know, a lot of people have asked me, well, what's gonna make my resume stand out? How can I be different? How can I make sure that they're gonna see me when there are so many other applications going out? And there's a few things. There are always the steadfast rules on what's going to make an effective resume. And so we wanna follow those guidelines, but then I would also suggest, let's take a step back and think about the resume is one component in an overall job search strategy. And you wanna make sure that you are leveraging multiple different tactics, approaches, um, when you're trying to find and land a job at any time, but particularly when we know that the um, job market is incredibly crowded and quite competitive. So let's start with just talking about the resume and what needs to go on there. The first thing, and I say this very frequently, but I want you to think of your resume more of a marketing document as opposed to a transcript of your work experience and your education. It's gonna include that information, but how much information we provide on each of those previous roles, what information we highlight or emphasize versus what we downplay or maybe omit, it's going to depend on what role you're targeting today. And so always keep in mind that it's not a transcript. It does not have to include every detail. In fact, it shouldn't. We really wanna look at what have you done the most recent 10 to 15 years, and how can we play that up and paint a picture for the reader that says, look, based on my experience, based on my, my skills, I'm a good fit for this role. And we wanna make it as easy as humanly possible for them to quickly glance at that resume and understand why you're a good fit for the role they're, they're trying to fill. 
So think of it as a marketing document and we have flexibility with how we format that and what information we, we uh, emphasize and what information we don't include to tell the best version of your career story. So that's the first thing. Uh, I don't know, about a year and a half ago, we did a resume study where we were looking at those resumes that were self-written, DIY versus professionally written resumes, trying to understand, well, what are the differences? Anybody can spell check really well. Anyone can make sure they have a professional email address on, on their resume. Anyone can make sure they've included the URL to their LinkedIn profile. I'm thinking of some of the, some of the mistakes that, that drive recruiters crazy. Anyone can make sure those things are on there and that you're including the right details. But what differentiates a professionally written resume that's more likely to impress a recruiter than say your DIY? So I want to talk a little bit about what that means and what and uh, how you can think about that as you're crafting your resume. So first of all, and I already kind of alluded to this, it's all about telling your career story. Uh, one of the three things that we found that really differentiated and grabbed the attention of a recruiter on a resume is, can you tell a good story? And again, this goes back to kind of the marketing thing, right? That's such a buzzword in marketing these days, storytelling. So how do you tell a story on your resume? Well, it really has to do with that top third of your resume. When you look at the top third, you want it to be a snapshot of everything you need the reader to know about you and to really get their interest so they want to read deeper into the rest of your resume. So we're talking about the contact information, a professional title that's going to explain very clearly what role you're targeting, a professional summary, and this takes the place of what most people would call a resume objective, um, where it's not necessarily about dating your goals, but more importantly, summarizing you as a professional in kind of an extended elevator pitch, so to speak, that's gonna very succinctly explain why you're qualified for the role you're pursuing. Why is this an, um, an opportunity that's a good match for you? Under that section, we tend to include what's known as core competencies or key skills. And this will differ depending on if you are right out of college or if you've been working for some time, what information we include here. But we're basically trying to summarize with key terms where your areas of expertise, what are your core competencies, what are the key skills, all of those things kind of mean the same thing when it comes to a resume. How can we make sure that if they quickly glance at the section that includes this information I just described, that they have already a sense of who you are as an individual and a professional and kind of the depth of your knowledge and expertise. And then we usually go into your professional experience, starting with the most recent role and working our way backwards, and then on to education, assuming that you didn't just graduate college. If you just graduated college, we like to put the education above the work experience because it tends to be one of your more recent and proudest bragging points. And we wanna make sure that the most relevant bragging points are towards the top of the page, and then we're working our way back. Does that make sense? I know I'm talking a little quickly right now, so just let me know um, if you have any questions as I'm going along. I'm happy to stop and ask questions because I'm just kind of giving you an overview. So we talked about the first thing that you're really trying to do is use your the first part of your resume, that top third, to create the snapshot that really sets the tone for the rest of your resume. How can you allude to what skills you possess, what qualifications you have that make you a good fit for the role you're looking at, and then um, state that up front because you're gonna back that information up in the rest of your resume. As you go into your work experience, your education, and the other things that may show up on your resume. So that's the career narrative. How can you tell a strong career narrative? Um, the second is creating visual balance. The information you include in your resume is just as important as how you format it and present it to the reader. Actually, I always say that if the content is king, then the design is queen because it is equally important. Uh, it, because we know two things. One, if you are applying for a job online and, this is, and the company is using what is known as an applicant tracking system or ATS, a piece of software that is going to scan your resume, parse the information, and then basically designate a score to your candidacy, uh, which will determine whether anyone ever sees your application after that point. We know that 
there are certain design elements and formats that do not work with those systems. So we wanna be very careful that we're designing the resume in a way where it can be read through this applicant tracking system, um, what we call the hiring bots or the digital gatekeeper. What else? The other part is that, assuming it gets past that, we know that the average recruiter spends less than 10 seconds looking at your application for the first time. And in those 10 seconds, they decide whether they're going to throw it in the no pile or put it in to be further reviewed pile. So obviously we wanna get into that pile, that's the good one. How do we do that? Well, formatting is incredibly important here. We wanna make sure that there's enough visual balance, that there's enough white space that we're using what's known as either an F or a T or an E kind of format. That's kind of think about the hierarchy of the information, an F or an E or even a T to the most part, how are you formatting that content so that it's very easy for the reader to draw their eye to the most important piece of information? I use bullet points and I consider bullet points to be bragging points. I save the bullet points to draw the reader's eye to the most important details that I want them to read because it helps. Um, that is a design technique. You wanna make sure that you're not trying to cram all this information onto one page. In fact, uh, there was a study done not too long ago by a company called ResumeGo that found that recruiters preferred um, two-page resume to a one-page resume, 2.3 times, I wanna say, 3.2 times, don't quote me on that. Uh, the moral of the story is recruiters preferred a two-page resume as opposed to a one-page. And I think that really echoes back to the fact that they like the career narrative. They want you to set the stage before you jump into your education and experience and all those fun details. And frankly, to do that, it requires more space. They would rather have it spaced out a bit and fall onto a second page so it's easier to read and the font isn't so small and you're not having these really tight paragraphs because again, they're quickly glancing at it. They don't wanna hunt for information. So we're talking a lot about how can you make sure that you're drawing the recruiters or the hiring manager's eye to the most important details on that application. Okay, we talked about two different, um, two of the three different things that differentiate kind of a resume that tends to get a recruiter's attention versus one that does not. Uh, we talked about a career narrative, visual balance, and then the third is proof, proof points. Um, you say you're a strong salesperson, you have to make sure you are proving that, demonstrating that, providing evidence that back, that supports the claims that you make. That's incredibly important. Uh, Think about it this way, and I know that a lot of people say, well, I have a, I have a doer job, I have a doer job, it doesn't, I'm not gonna have a lot of achievements to put on my resume. That's okay. Um, whenever you're looking at each role that you've held in the past, first thing you wanna think about, well, what skills did I leverage? What kind of work was I doing? What was I exposed to? What did I get better at? Um, what did my role entail? What was I expected to do? And more importantly, when I wasn't there, what balls got dropped or what, what, what fell behind because I wasn't there to do it? That's the information that we wanna make sure we summarize. This is kind of the summary of my role. When it comes to the bullet points, hey, if you can say you beat quota by 100% or you brought this project with this budget amount, um, you know, you brought it in under budget and on time, of course, that's great. The more you can quantify your success, the more you have notable achievements to actually point to, obviously, the easier it is to write your resume. Um, if you don't have one of those jobs where you have all those things, you're like, yeah, that's great, Amanda. I don't have a job that I could ever do that with. Now I want you to start thinking about, well, what examples demonstrate that you're good at what you do? If you're a hostess or a waiter, do you get the best tables, the busiest time slots, the, the busiest section? Have you been asked to mentor or train new hires? Those all demonstrate you're good. Um, if it was a seasonal job where you back, asked back multiple seasons, that proves that you are good at your job. So that's what I want you to think about. Um, when you're thinking about what to put in those bullet points, what have I done, what have I been asked to do that shows they think I'm good at what I do and they like what I do or what I did if, I no, if you no longer work there anymore. And I think that's, that's something to keep in mind. Um, if you don't already have this, I highly suggest making what's known as a brag book. And simply put, 
It's a place where you record your achievements, your accomplishments. When somebody gives you a great review, when a customer tells you you're awesome, when you talk to your boss and they, they provide you with some constructive feedback. Whenever something's happening, your role changes, you wanna be documenting that information, including the numbers, so that the next time you have to write a resume, it will be a lot easier. Okay, so I talked about those three things that typically um, you know, help make your resume stand out. Now let's just talk about very quickly what's going on in today's economy and what are some other things you should be thinking about. Uh, so many jobs right now are uh, located remotely. They're virtual positions, either indefinitely or for the foreseeable future until the corporate offices are opening up. I know it's different all across the country. I'm in New York and most of my friends uh, are not planning to be back in their office until <laughs> some are saying September, some are saying January. So that's that's kind of where we're at at the moment, if that gives you any sense of, where, of how we're feeling over here. Uh, but we know that so many businesses are either considering making more of their staff remote all the time, and so many businesses are still doing that. So one thing that will help you on your application, even if the job you're applying for doesn't list itself as remote forever, Make sure you're emphasizing certain details and demonstrating that you would be great at working remotely, either for now or forever. Uh, a couple things to keep in mind. If you've worked remotely in the past or if you've worked in a job where you had extensive travel, so you were basically working out of a hotel room or a car uh, or a train or something along those lines, you want to emphasize that information. You can include it by putting you know, next to your job title in the parentheses that... Um, that the position was virtual. Um, you can mention when you're describing your role or responsibilities that it was a virtual position or that you were required to travel 75% of the year, whatever it was. Um, in your accomplishments, if you and a virtual team accomplished anything, you can emphasize that and mention it. You were in a five person virtual team, something to that effect. So definitely keep that kind of stuff in mind. People want to know that you feel comfortable working remotely because so many of us are doing so right now. Um, also things to keep in mind, there are certain softer skills that we call them uh, that are prioritized by employers right now. Adaptability, flexibility, creative problem solving, critical thinking. These are things they came out in a LinkedIn article not long ago. It's something that I've written quite a bit about um, for various uh, publications. We know that these are skills that employers are prioritizing. So in addition to the job specific skills that are required for the job, if you can demonstrate that you can think on your feet, that you can get creative when you need to solve a problem or complete a task, whether you don't have all the resources in front of you or you had to make it work, you want to find those examples and leverage them, incorporate them into your resume because you want to show them that you are exactly the type of person they're looking to hire right now. Um, what are some other things? For the, when it comes to remote, some of the softer skills that are prioritized by employers, this includes be self-discipline, tech savviness, or at least a comfort using uh, communication tools such as Slack, Gmail, whatever it is, um, the various tools that are used to communicate, video conferencing, those things. Uh, you wanna make sure that's kind of included in your tech skills, or at least there's one line in your cover letter that mentions that you have a dedicated workspace that if the role requires you to work from home for a, a certain period of time that you are willing and able to do so, you have um, you know, a relatively um, new uh, laptop and you have you know, a fast, uh, reliable internet connection, things of a nature that says, I've thought about this. I've thought about um, the role itself and how I have the skills you're looking for, but guess what? I also have some of those other skills that employers in general are desiring, prioritizing these days given what's going on. So those are some other things that I would say, hey, make sure that you are emphasizing those. Um, we've had some questions start popping in, so I'm gonna jump into those, but if there's anything I talked about and you'd love to hear more about that specific topic or any additional questions have popped up into your head as a result of what I've been explaining, please let me know. Just put your questions in the comments below or just let me know there's something you'd like me to elaborate on. I'm happy to go into greater detail on anything. So I'm gonna scroll back up for a second. Hi, Steven, it's so nice to see you. 
If a recruiter sees your resume the first time and you apply to a different position, do they just overlook your application? Um, that's a great question. So I'm assuming this means either applying for a, um, more than one job at the same company and you didn't hear anything back from that first role and now you're looking at other positions at the company. Um, it could even mean um, a third party recruiter, uh, so an agency that's posting a bunch of jobs on behalf of their clients and your resume is coming through their desk. Um, not necessarily, does not mean you will necessarily be overlooked, but I think there's a big caveat. You have to make sure that you're customizing your application for each of those positions. So unless those positions are identical, your resume should not be identical. And if the position is very, very similar and your application um, did not receive a response, I would take a step back and um, take a look at your resume and compare it to that job description and see what types of modifications you could make in order to ensure that your resume is really speaking to the requirements that are listed in the job. So there are a few things that we talk about when customizing your resume for a specific application. And just to put it out there, I do always recommend that you are evaluating your resume against a specific job description and making minor modifications before you submit that application. I do not think it should be an overhaul of your resume. If you are overhauling your resume for every single job application, my suggestion would be let's, let's take a look at those goals again and can we refine them a bit more because it must mean that you're applying to very different roles. And if there are two completely different career paths you can go, fine, have two completely different resumes. Just be aware that you can only have one LinkedIn profile, so that's where the challenge comes. Uh, but um, within that one career path, you want to try to focus on jobs that are all of a similar nature because based on those jobs, that's how you create what I, I call your base resume or your foundational resume. And then you're making minor modifications along the way, almost an evolution of that resume based on what you're seeing in the job description. So a couple things to keep in mind, simple changes that suddenly make you look like you're really speaking to the job description and will catch the recruiter's eye to the fact that they may not even know that it's the same person applying at first. Um, your professional title, you might tweak the language to mirror whatever the job title is in the job description. If it's um, marketing director on one and director of marketing on the next job listing, tweak it, switch it have it so that they line up. Believe it or not, that makes a difference because when they're briefly looking at your resume, it's just, oh look, they do have exactly what I'm looking for. Um, go through the job description and look for specific terms that are routinely popping up. How are they describing the requirements? How are they describing the type of work you will be doing? Highlight that information if you've done it, particularly if on the job description it shows up more than once and maybe they word it differently in different spots. However they're wording it on the job application, you want to mirror that in your resume. So you may have already described that same type of work, but you may have just used slightly different language. Switch the language to match what you're seeing in the job description. It will help with the applicant tracking system and it will help when a human being's looking at it because they know what their job description looks like. And frankly, without even thinking about it, they're like, oh yeah, this person really hits what I'm looking for. So keep that in mind. You may also re reorder the bullet points under certain jobs so that the ones that are most relevant to this job description are at the top and then you work your way down um, for a particular role. And same thing with core competencies and areas of expertise. I would take that section and you might be swapping out some words or re ordering the terms so that again the, the information that is most relevant to this particular job description is the stuff you're seeing first. Um, if you're unsure how to identify those terms other than simply looking at the job description, you can take the job description and put it into a word cloud generator. Um, you Google word cloud generator, you'll find lots of free ones. I use Wordle. I have no affiliation with them. It's just the one that I found that I use, but there are plenty out there and that will help you understand which words are routinely popping up on that resume or I'm sorry, on that job description. And then you can incorporate that information both into the core competencies as well as the rest of your resume. Um, just going back to see if there's anything else. So no, I don't think they're going to overlook you. The one thing I will keep in mind is that if you have an if, if the company is using a major applicant tracking system and you have a login to that company's account, 
Uh, you want to be careful that you upload the new version of your resume or you choose if it allows you to upload multiple ones you choose the one that speaks to, to that job listing because that's going to be very helpful in ensuring that you're not overlooked so great question abby asks is it true that ats systems can't read pdfs properly yes and no it, it's I know it's a super fun answer, but it depends. It's truly going to depend on what applicant tracking system that company is using and how sophisticated it is. And so my recommendation is you should always have a PDF version and a Word doc version of your resume properly formatted, designed, and ready to go. Um, and then if when you are applying for a job and they tell you to upload your resume, if it gives you a list of what file types are accepted and PDF is listed, by all means use the PDF because it does, it holds the design better. Um, and so obviously it's gonna be more visually appealing. If it doesn't list it, what, you know, what files are acceptable, I would play it safe and I would use the, the resume version. If you're emailing it to anybody, so this actually came up, a colleague asked me about this and she said, if you're emailing it to someone, can I use the PDF because it's not going through the applicant tracking system, right? So I don't have to worry about that. And honestly, if it was me and it was somebody I knew, like a networking connection, I would email them both, both versions. That's just me, but I'd say, here you go. In case this has to go into your company's applicant tracking system, I gave you both versions. You know, let, let me know if you have any questions. If it was just to an individual recruiter or they said submit your applications through an email address, I'd probably stick with a PDF and have the resume as a backup just in case. That's an excellent question. Okay, what suggestions do you have? Cardillo. Oh, hi, John. It's so great to see you. Um, never, ever use pages. <laughs> fair, fair point. Um, what suggestions do you have for a LinkedIn profile? Because it is public for everyone, it's not tailored to a specific job or field. Ooh, great, great, great question. It's true. Um, and I actually did research on this because I had been asked in the past, well, can I just have more than one LinkedIn profile? And no, LinkedIn does not want you to have more than one LinkedIn profile. They actually have it in their rules and say if they discover that you are doing that, they will boot you off their system. Um, but honestly, it doesn't work very well for you either because one of the main strengths or you know advantages to using something like LinkedIn as a networking research business tool is the strength of your network. The larger your network is, the, the more people you're connected to, the further your reach is, the more people you can look into. So say you're researching for a job and you want to look for second connections that are somehow second and first connections that are somehow related to a company that you're super interested in. Obviously, the more people you're connected with, the more likely you are to actually have someone within your extended network that's linked to that organization. So you don't want to have to like split your organ, split your contacts up, nor do you want to try and connect everybody twice. So that's one thing. So how do you create a LinkedIn profile that's just one when you can't tailor it for a specific role? So if, if you're um, using LinkedIn and you're applying for jobs and they say, well, submit your, you know, you can submit your profile as the application. I mean, if that's the way they want them, obviously that's what you're gonna do. You might try and make minor tweaks to your LinkedIn profile, but I'd also have my resume on standby and look for that um, listing elsewhere or look to see if they'll allow you to submit your resume. Um, when it comes to tailoring your LinkedIn profile in general, so your headline is gonna be a little bit more vague. It's not gonna be the specific title that's specific to every role you're, you're applying for because obviously the job titles will slightly differ, but you're gonna one, use one that's kind of a blanket term that covers all of it uh, you're going to you know create um, your summary I believe it's called as opposed to a professional summary on your resume the summary on your LinkedIn profile I actually like to go a little bit more personal with it um, that's the real big difference between say a social media profile like LinkedIn and your resume a resume is kind of a cut and dried document there are certain things that we expect to see and that we don't expect to see in a resume um, on a social platform such as LinkedIn it's a bit more social and what I do like about it is it, it can provide 
much greater insight into you as an individual, um, what propelled you into this career, why are you interested in it, what have you been doing outside of work that, that relates to what you want to do. You can use pronouns, you can you know start off your professional summary talking about how you got into this work or if you're trying to break into a new industry, what from your childhood or your past do you think kind of spurred this interest and how has it manifested itself since then. Um, so I like to start out with a little personal paragraph that really describes what am I about and how did I get here and give them like a little bit more of a window into my personality and then I often take the professional summary from the resume maybe slightly modify it but then include that at the bottom as well as as well as um, random different spellings of my name in case that's um, it's commonly misspelled um, or I have nicknames so to make sure they're still gonna find me I also include my core competencies um, or areas of expertise at the bottom of that. Now, when it comes to the real tweaking of the LinkedIn profile, your LinkedIn profile is basically gonna be a, um, similar to what I call your foundational or your base resume. And how you create that resume, which then also helps you create the LinkedIn profile, um, I suggest finding three to five job descriptions that accurately reflect the type of role you're pursuing now. And I'm emphasizing now because I realize that a lot of people's industries and sectors and businesses have been turned upside down. So the career that you've been pursuing for years or the one you had your heart set on when you went into college may not be an option right now. And I, that's an awful thing. And I, I know I can only imagine how, how hard it is. Um, but when you're looking at your application materials, your personal branding materials today, what I want to emphasize is that your materials have to reflect the role you're pursuing today. So whatever that is, whether it's a short term, um, you know, a short term goal to get you by a temporary position or more of a long term um, you know, job search, you want to make sure that your LinkedIn profile and your resume reflect that current goal. And so find those three to five jobs that reflect the type of role you believe you're qualified for and you're going to currently pursue. And then using those, we want to identify what are the skills that are routinely popping up? What are the requirements? What type of experience are they expecting you to have? What soft and hard or technical skills uh, are required or desirable? And you're using this information to help inform you as to when you're reviewing your previous work experience, when you're reviewing your uh, activities outside of work, uh, all those types of things. When you're even considering, well, what have I accomplished in each of my jobs? You're thinking of it with that information in mind because it's gonna help you determine which pieces you're gonna emphasize and which pieces may not um, have, may not have a place on your resume right now because they're not relevant to the job today. That's, I talked at the beginning of this that uh, your resume is a marketing document. It's not a transcript of your education and your work experience. It's carefully curated to reflect uh, the most important or relevant pieces of your work history that are relevant to what you're doing now or what you're pursuing now. Uh, so keep that in mind. Um, you're writing this marketing document for a target audience, not for um, yourself. And I know that seems so crazy because resumes are such personal documents. I mean, I would never write my own resume. I would, I would hand it probably to John Cardilla. I would hand it to one of my, one of my resume writing friends because honestly, um, it's too personal and I would have a hard time being objective and saying, well, is this information which I'm really proud of, does it belong on my resume given what I'm looking for today? Yes or no. Um, so it's nice to have that objective perspective. Um, that's why we always encourage you to use a resume writing service such as Top Resume, right? Um, that said, um, you have to keep in mind that when you're writing your resume, it's for a target audience. Not, not necessarily you, but uh, a prospective employer, a recruiter, the hiring manager. You're writing it for the person who's filling a role. Uh, and basically you want them to read your resume and clearly understand very quickly why you're qualified for the role that they're filling now. Why should they care about what you're saying? How is it relevant to what they're doing now? And for them, it is all about the job we're filling now. Um, so something to keep in mind.
Great question. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know if I am. So um, we talked about you review three to five job descriptions that all kind of um, describe the role that you're looking for now. You're looking for the commonalities between those job descriptions. What is constantly being emphasized or what terminology are they using? What are the requirements? And then you're putting that to the side and now reviewing each of your previous roles with that information in mind and you're reframing your experience to highlight the pieces that really match up or with what you were seeing in those job descriptions because you want it to be a reflection of what they're looking for. Ah, uh, thanks, Steve. I'm so glad you like it. All right. I love that question, Abby. I know I went really off on a tangent, but I hope it was helpful. Um, and if you have... If you have experience in multiple industries or more multiple fields, you're going to make sure that you're including that in that summary on your LinkedIn profile that says, you know, I've been doing this type of work in various industries from blah, 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 high tech to financial services. You know, you actually list them because again, if a recruiter's looking for a specific t persona, a specific profile, you want to make sure you have those words in. Whereas maybe when you were applying for a specific role, you would remove some of those and only keep the ones in that are relevant relevant to the job you're applying for. So that's some, that though that's really where the differences are is that the LinkedIn profile is going to be a little bit more all encompassing because you're trying to cover your bases. Okay. A company I worked for changed names several times during my 16 years there. How do you handle the name changes on a resume? Oh, that's a really interesting one. Several times, that's really interesting. Um, there are two ways you can handle it, and I think it's kind of, it gets debated. Um, you can put what the company name is now, and then in parentheses next to it, formally known as blah, 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 or acquired by this company in this year to provide context as to, I typically, I'm, I'm trying to think, but what I, I typically do is I think I stick with the, the um, its name now, assuming the company still exists. And then um, depending on what I'm working with, and that's, that's the fun thing about resumes, right? There are guidelines, but there are, there are very few hard and fast rules because it's all about what are you working with, what is that, that person's goals, and then you're making decisions based on those factors. So oftentimes for resumes, I will have a company name and I'll have the location, and then directly underneath that company name, I will include one line that describes the organization. Uh, and I typically do this for anybody who, Frank, we have the space and we can make it work within two pages. Uh, but more importantly, if the company names are not well-known household names globally recognized, I want to provide a bit more context because Everybody knows who you know what Target is. Everyone knows Coca Cola. They they know the big brands, but um, when you've worked it for smaller organizations, even if they've all been within one industry, it's no guarantee that the person looking at your resume will know that company offhand. And so I like to provide a line that. And it, it, when I say a line, I literally mean one line across the page. You don't want it to take up more space than that. Uh, but a line that describes the company either by. Um, it describes what they produce or sell, what service they provide, how big of an organization is, if it's a hospital, maybe how many beds they have, um, how many workers worldwide, um, annual revenue, are they the largest producer of blah, blah, blah in the Southeast, whatever it is, I'm tr I add that information in because I not only want to make sure that if they look anything up, they're looking at the right company, but I'm also trying to provide some greater context into my title as it relates to that size organization. Also, if I'm trying to change careers, I'm trying to emphasize whatever about this company, I'm trying to bridge to my next role. So maybe I'm not going in that industry, but I'm trying to stick to organizations that all sell to the same type of consumer. So maybe I would delve a little deeper in that one liner, more about who they sell to, who are the clients or the target audience, so that it relates back. Again, I'm always thinking about whatever I'm putting on this resume, how does it relate to what I'm looking for now? How can I help them you know, uh, connect the dots when they're looking at my resume? Uh, 
So for somebody whose company has changed multiple times, I think I, and you know, it's a, I, I think we go back and forth on this, um, but I typically put the current name because that's what they'll find a website for. That's what they'll actually find online if they if they try to delve deeper, if they need to do um, a reference check or something like that. That's how they're going to get to that organization. But then I might put in parentheses like formerly known as blah 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 or merge with this company on X year or was purchased by this company or previously known as something along those lines just so they're aware. And I like to include the date that when this change occurred typically you can find that online either on their wiki page or somewhere you can typically find that information if you google um, the old company name and the new company name there's typically some sort of press release or news item out there that will give you a date if you don't remember it um, and I like to have that piece so that when they're looking at your dates of tenure they can put it into perspective if it changed multiple times I think there's a difference between if it changed versus it was acquired and then its name changed. Um, if there were multiple changes, I might divvy up your experience between two different employers if it's one that was bought by the other and this happened and you had a lot of name changes in between. So again, you kind of play with it. Um, and I hope that that's something that just everyone's kind of getting from this is that there are very few hard and fast rules. A lot of it is guidelines and it's always gonna come with the caveat of, well, what do you have to work with? What are your goals? We're not gonna lie, we're not gonna make things up. If you don't have pieces of information to do what we're trying to do, what else could we do that's going to, number one, tell the best story, uh, present your information in a visually appearing, appealing way, and back up your statements with proof back up your claims that you are good at X, Y, and Z with whatever proof we can muster. Okay, Claudia asks, I applied to a great job post where I match 100%, sent the resume and a cover letter, still waiting for a response. Is it a good practice to look for the hiring manager in, in LinkedIn and introduce myself or ask for the connection in common to refer me? 100% if you have a mutual connection, leverage those connections. In fact, um, you are 10 times more likely to land the job when your application is accompanied by a referral. And a referral does not necessarily mean that it's somebody who works for the company already, though of course that is ideal. It could be you just happen to have a mutual connection with the recruiter or with the hiring manager. Especially now, we know there are so many applications out there. There is so much competition. There's a lot of noise. And because everyone's so, and rightfully so, nervous and anxious about the job market and finding a job and that sort of thing, you will find that people um, want to do something to advance their position and to make progress in their, in their job search. So you will also see people applying for a larger volume of jobs and with not necessarily all of those jobs being the best fit. And so you are fighting against what I call the noise. A lot of those applications where as a, as a hiring manager, I look and I go, why? I don't even understand why this person applied. I'm looking at the, I'm looking at my job description. I'm looking at this person and I, and I do, and there's no explanation, in, you know, in the, in the resume or the cover letter that's explaining why this makes sense. Um, and so because of that, the chances of your application being accidentally overlooked are, are greater. So whenever you can leverage a personal connection or a professional connection um, to introduce yourself to um, the hiring manager or the recruiter in charge of, of filling the position, 100% do it. Um, I would even try and do it before you apply for the job in the first place. Uh, I normally would, you know, if, if it's somebody that I'm kind of loosely connected to or maybe it's a fellow alumni from my, from my university, maybe it's somebody where we have some sort of mutual group um, and I see that they're, they previously or currently worked at the company I'm interested in, I would even reach out to them and say, hi, this is who I am. I noticed we, we both, you know, we both worked here. Or we, you know, we both graduated or we were both in the same fraternity or sorority, whatever it is. Um, and say, you know, I noticed you currently or previously worked at X organization. I was just looking at a position for them. It seems really interesting and a great fit for my experience, but I'd love to get a better sense of what it's like to work there. You know, would you be willing to chat with me for a few minutes and just tell me what, you know, your experience there? And then ultimately you're asking for them to pass your, your resume along. Um, if you know someone who knows the hiring manager, 100%, especially if it's somebody that's close, you always, 
you can decide how, <laughs> I don't wanna say demanding, but you can decide how direct you will be with your communication based on how well you know this person and what type of relationship you have. But if, you, if it's like, hey, bestie, how do you know Lindsay Slater at Google or Facebook or whatever it is? Um, I found this role. I think I'm a great fit for it based on what I'm reading online. I applied, I haven't heard anything. I saw that this recruiter is connected to that job. Uh, would you be willing to introduce me and pass my application along? And you know, something to that effect. Obviously you can, you can play with that language a little bit, but that's the general idea. 100% do it. Um, if you don't know anybody and you can't find a connection, should you reach out to that person on LinkedIn? Why not? I mean, honestly, I, at this point, I'm saying, why not? What's the worst it's gonna do? They're gonna ignore it? Um, be, you know, be careful how you word it. You wanna think about, hi, my name's so-and-so. Uh, you know, this is kind of my background. I would look at their profile and see, is there anything you have in common? Google their name, put up a Google, look what you can find and say, oh, do we happen? It seems like we both enjoy X, Y, and Z, or are we both part of this group, or did we, do we have a mutual connections, but somebody I don't really feel comfortable reaching out to? Whatever it is, try and leverage that information because obviously the warmer the le that, that contact is, the, the more likely they'll respond. But you might as well reach out and say, hi, you know, this is so-and-so, I have this type of experience. I saw that your organization is hiring for this role. Um, would, would love, you know, five minutes of your time to learn more about the opportunity or if you could pass me to the right person, that sort of thing. Um, but why not? What's the worst that can happen? They ignore you. Uh, you know, it's just, I, I think the one thing with, with job searches, in some ways it is a numbers game. Um, I want you to apply to roles that are relevant. I want you to make sure you're applying for jobs where you do meet the, the core qualifications. Um, but when it comes to reaching out to people while we're tailoring things, while we're being thoughtful about who we're connecting to, what we're saying and what roles we're applying for, it is a volume game to some extent. So keep that in mind. How do you explain, okay, Carmine, how do you explain unemployment years in a resume? Okay, so how do you, how do you, how do you explain uh, uh, an, an employment gap? That, that's more commonly. And when you're looking for advice on this, and I've been really bad today about referring to articles on our site, so I apologize for that. Um, but I know, um, Jenna, if you would be so kind, we definitely have um, an article both on interviewing as well as resume writing that specifically deals with when you have an employment gap. A um, few things. If it's a recent unemployment gap, as in you're unemployed at the moment, I would look and see what could you be doing now to help minimize that gap. So that's, that's, um, a, that, that's always helpful. That could be in the form of internships. That could be in the form of freelance work. It could be in the form of volunteer experience, or my favorite, if you've ever attended one of these, skills, skill-based volunteer opportunities. If you look up skill-based volunteer opportunities, there's a great site called Catch a Fire. Um, for whatever reason, that's always the one I can remember and there are many others out there, but that is always the one that springs to mind. Uh, you can say, these are my skills. What nonprofit organizations are looking for my type of experience or expertise? And then you can help them with a project. Again, it's pro bono, but it fills the gap on your resume. And that's something that I haven't mentioned, but I wanna make sure that I'm being clear on. Um, again, your professional experience, your resume is a curated marketing document. You can 100% mention experience where you weren't being paid for it. All you want to do is demonstrate how you've been leveraging relevant skills and how have you been doing the type of work that's relevant or building, building skill sets that are relevant to what they're looking for today. It doesn't matter if you got paid, just what were you doing? Did you have a project? Is there something you can point to? How did you help them? What was the output? That alone is great. Other things to keep in mind, you can play with the dates. And by that, I do not mean lying. <laughs> what I do mean is that you don't necessarily have to put month and year when you're talking about start dates and end dates for roles. I've also seen people use their end date as, um, and this is if they do decide to use month and, and year, um, they've done it to the end of their severance package as opposed to when they left the organization. It's a gray area, to be honest, it's, it's a bit of a gray area. Um, look at your experience and see 
if you use month and year versus just year, does it make does it make your gap look smaller? Would it be perceived as smaller or does it actually perceive it as it could be quite bigger? So for instance, if, um, if your job ended in December 2015 and you didn't find work until September of 2016, you might be better off just putting years so that they don't know how long it was. Um, if it was December and then you found a job in January, you might want to put that and say, look, I bounced from one straight to the next. Don't assume I had a gap there. So um, look at it and see, well, which one just looks better? Which one seems to, to make the gap less noticeable? And that's the one you're going to go with. Now, if there was a legit reason why you were, you were not working for a period of time, maybe you stayed at home to raise your family, you were caring for a sick um, relative, um, you were sick yourself, I don't like to go into that, that information in too many details because I don't want them reading into that and trying to, you know, make, make inferences about me and who I am and am I, you know, am I healthy and qualified to work in that sort of thing. But I might um, mention a line of it in a cover letter if I think it's really necessary. If I was going to school, if I left my job and decided I was gonna go and pursue my, my education and so I was out of work for a few years, I would actually put that as a line um, in the professional experience where it was like from the, this year to this year in the college name and just put a note underneath that says um, pursued MBA from this year to this year. So that's why there was a two or three year gap on my resume because I was a full-time student and that's what I was doing. And then the details of my education would still fall in my education section, which is typically at the end of your resume. I'm not gonna lie, I have no sense of what time it is, so I'm checking really quick. Ah, yes, we're not over yet, guys. I cannot answer more questions. Um, if you were let go due to COVID, should that be mentioned in your resume? This is from Madeline. I don't think so. I mean, the dates of, of your, the end dates of your employment, I think people make assumptions that way. And so I think there's a lot more understanding and a little, a little bit more leniency when people are looking at that sort of thing. Um, if you were laid off during COVID, being laid off is not your fault. It has not, it does not speak to your experience. It does not speak to anything um, about you know, your skill set or your work ethic or your, your production, um, you might, I actually, you know what, in truth, I save it for the interview. I'm like really thinking through this. And if they ask me, well, what happened? I will, oh, I was one of, of a large group, or I was one of 200 that were, that were laid off during the blah, blah, blah. I would mention that more in an interview and only if they asked. If they're not asking, there's no reason to bring it up. If anybody has an end date that has been from March through now, I think most people are make, make the assumption that it's related to COVID and they're not really thinking twice about it. And so I don't think it's something you have to emphasize. Um, if you're reaching out to people in your network, I think there's nothing wrong with kind of saying, you know, this is the situation and, and you know, you mentioned it and you're moving on to, and I'm currently interested in opportunities such as this and this, because these would really allow me to leverage this type of experience that I have and these skills that I've developed to do this type of work and create these um, types of results for these types of organizations. So I think it's really more about how can you fo focus it more on what you're looking for, what you've learned from that company, the skills you've built, and, and where you're trying to take it next. This is also especially if you are now considering perhaps a job change. And I've heard a lot of this talk right now. Um, actually, Top Resume just released a study uh, on the 7th, so what, a week ago, uh, that we asked over a thousand of you, based on how you were treated during COVID, would you consider leaving your employer? And 68% said, yep, yep. They didn't give me the flexibility I, didn't, I needed to care for my family uh, or homeschool during this time. They wouldn't, you know, they didn't care that I didn't have child, child care during this time. Uh, their communication was piss poor, excuse my language, but you know, there was really shoddy communication. I felt neglected. Nobody was keeping me updated. I don't like how they handled layoffs or furloughs, whatever it is, there were pay cuts. There were hours reduced with little warning. Um, they put me in what I consider to be ha hazardous situations and, and didn't seem to care. You know, there's a lot of that going around right now. And so, um, 
I think a lot of people are not just saying, I want a new job, but perhaps I want a completely different career track after all of this. This has kind of been my, hmm, take a step back and reevaluate moment. And I think we're gonna see a lot of that. And so um, it's really important to talk about what you've learned, what skills you've built, and more importantly, how those can be relevant towards whatever role you're going towards, whether it's the same career path you've been on or you're looking to uh, perhaps make a different, make, it, make a turn left or right to a, to a different field altogether. You are quite welcome. Oh, so Carmine, so um, you relocated and you had a baby. Yeah, 100%. Um, you know, you could make a mention in your cover letter that, you know, you took, you know, um, you re relocated, maybe it was due to your partner or something like that. You relocated and had to leave your job and, um, you know, started a family and now you're ready to get back to work. Also, the more you can build a network, um, now that, now that you're here, the better it will be. And something I want to keep in mind, cause I've, I've done talks on networking and funny enough, a lot of people don't want to show up for the networking talks, but it's so, so, cause either you love networking or you hate it. And frankly, it is it's imperative if our job search these days um, so one thing to keep in mind is it doesn't have to be all your professional contacts think about the mommy friends you've made think about the people you've met outside of work the people who have the same interests as you friends of friends family members their friends that is all part of your network you never know who those people know or what they do for a living or how they might be able to help you so I always try and identify who are the social butterflies within any given group of friends um, even if they have nothing to do with my industry or my line of work because the social butterflies are the ones who will tend to run in very different and multiple um, circles and as a result they are just more likely to know people outside of their profession and be able to hook you up and introduce you to people so that's always a first step I would take is identify well who are the power connectors the social butterflies in my network and reach out to them and say hey so this is what I'm looking to do or I'm I'm focusing on these types of roles who do you know in that area do you know anyone who's doing that type of work is there anyone that you could introduce me to because those are the people that can typically help you out and you are ten times more likely to land the job when you're application is accompanied by a referral and I have I'm gonna repeat that a million times more than one study came up with that same stat it's an older stat but frankly I think if anything it's only increased over time yes John Cardillo volunteer match I can never remember the names there there's one where it's the the icons like a hand I can never remember it's awful um, Jenna, I know we probably have that list somewhere. I, I know I have a list of all the, the um, skill-based volunteer um, sites because there's a, good, there's a good handful of them. I gotta say, there's gotta be at least five or six that I typically recommend. Okay, Shahal said, I started in an organization in a role and eventually transitioned into a high position role in the same organization. How do I mention both of work experiences in the same organization? Oh, so you, okay, so I held multiple roles at the same company. Okay, if the most recent role is most relevant to what you're looking to do, um, I would obviously spend a lot more space covering that role and dedicate less space to the earlier role or roles. There are a couple different ways you can format this on your resume. And Jenna, I don't know if you can pull it up really quickly, but I think there is an Ask Amanda question, or I know we have one, at least one piece of content that talks about um, when you've had multiple jobs at the same company, how do you format that on your resume? So there are a couple ways. You can start with the company name, obviously, and your entire tenure at that company. How many years did you work there? all the roles combined. And that's the years of start and end date that you put for the company name. Then depending on each of the roles you held there and how they were relevant and what, I mean, if you got an entry level customer service job and then you moved into and eventually became a marketing director, chances are you're gonna dedicate very little space to that customer service job that you had when you first joined the company and you were new, new to your career. If you progress from marketing associate to marketing director to VP of marketing or whatever it is and you're trying to show um, the evolution of, of your career, kind of that vertical path up, 
um, then I would probably show a little bit more of, of those individual roles. But you start with the most recent one. You um, may mention that you were promoted from the last job um, at the company due to X, Y, and Z. And then you go into the description of that role and the bullet points that talk specifically about your most recent position. Then if it really warrants it and there's enough meat there and it's relevant to your overall job goals, you would put the other job title, its start and end dates, and um, a, a blurb about that job as well. So you can do that where you start with the company name, give the dates for the full range that you worked at that organization, and then with each role underneath, you'll put the job title and how long you worked in that job. Start start year, end year, start date, end date for that for that position detail out that information, then go to the next one further back in history. You can do that. If you went from senior manager to director of the same, of the same guest, thank you for adding that, that link, Jenna. Um, if you say you were promoted from director to senior director, I don't think you have to necessarily put both of those roles out. What I would do is put both titles, one on top of the other, put their start and end years, and then in your blurb, talk about how you're promoted from one after X amount of time for doing X, Y, and Z, and really just focus on the information that's most relevant. Um, it could be a culmination of those two jobs, um, or it could be that most recent job where you talk about your role and responsibilities, and then use the bullet points to highlight the most important details, such as um, you know uh, awards that you won, accomplishments, output and whenever possible numbers number numbers quantify that information as much as humanly possible i'm checking time don't mind me just logging back into my computer okay <laughs> we are about at time i'm just looking to see if i missed any there's one more from madeline i've taken courses in my field through Coursera, can I highlight this information? How do I do it? Um, I love that. If you've taken online courses, certifications, micro credentials, 100% add that into the education section of your resume. I would do education and professional development, mention that there, and then mention it in your professional summary, how you've been dedicated to your professional development by taking, you know, recently, you know, refresh skills on X, Y, and Z. I'd also incorporate that information into your cover letter, especially if you're coming back from being um, out of work for some time. So demonstrating what have I been doing to keep my skills sharp? You can answer that question for them in the cover letter. Um, I wanna thank you all so much. Again, my name is Amanda Augustine. I'm the resident career expert for Top Resume and our sister sites, Top Interview and Top CV. Thanks so much for tuning in today. And if there's a particular topic you'd like me to cover in another one of these, please leave it in the comments below, either something specific to resume writing or a different area of the job search. I would be happy to go into that. Just let me know. And again, I will see you next month. Take care, everyone. Come on, finish.